Welcome to the Business Trendsetter Podcast, where we talk about trends and how to use them to grow your business. My name is Manny Turan. And I'm Adam Hartung. We are Spark Partners. We're coming to you every week to talk about trends and how powerful they are in growing your business. And we even assert that they are potentially the most powerful thing in your business to watch out for. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, that Adam and I do, in addition to uh, supporting customers and clients that are trying to grow, is we look at what's happening in, in the general um, population of, of businesses, where are the trends going, which uh, are the most important to watch out for, which ones are fads, which ones come and go. And one of these, of course, that has been a kind of a hot topic recently is the idea of working from home. Now, the pandemic was, uh, was obviously a big driver to this, but this is already happening. Uh, uh, me, for instance, I was a um, working from home back in 2001, back when it was not even a thing. But here we are 22 years later, and it's, it's become very commonplace. And we've got companies that are uh, wanting their employees to come back, like even Tesla and uh, you know, Elon Musk. And even Zoom has asked their, their folks to come back home. So yeah. let's start there, Adam, and then let's kind of weave our way into uh, some of the bigger things happening in the, in the world. Yeah, so I think we have these podcasts, and Manny, do you remember the last time that you and I met each other in real person? I would say it's probably been two years. Uh, you were down here for uh, some, or you know what, maybe I was up in Las Vegas, actually. This is when you lived in your old house. So it's been probably yeah. two years. Three years. Three. It's been three years. Three years since we saw each other. And this, I, want, I bring that up because here we've been thriving, you and I, doing our thing and making our podcast. And for three years, we haven't even been in the same room with each other. Right. And I think it's, uh, it's, just, it's just something that, to tell people that, look, we can have, you can have these very important long-term business relationships, and they don't require people to be in the same room. Right. Now, the pandemic accelerated the way we thought about this. And, of course, the, the peak was in uh, was in I got I got the data here okay uh, the, the ninth, in December of twenty two um, uh, we peaked with the sixty two percent of all work days now, this is economic data so this includes carpenters and plumbers and electricians these people have to go to work on a site right so they take that's a work day and then there's you and I have a work day in an office or we have a work day from home but they're all work days. At the peak of the pandemic, 12 of 22, 62% of all work days were at home. Wow. Okay? Now, that was when basically a lot of our government officials said, you got to shut things down. And so uh, restaurants were closed, casinos were closed, uh, office buildings were closed. So it re peaked at 62%. They thought, then there was this idea that the whole thing reversed itself in December of, um, I'm sorry, that was, I'm going to get back again. It was, that was in, the peak was in, I'm sorry, 20. Okay. It was in December of 20. It was in December of 22. It had fallen back to 29%, right? So that peak 62% was in 20. Then in 22, it was 29% of workdays. And this caused some people to say, oh, look, their work from home isn't nearly as big a deal as it was before. Well, in July of 23, this just past July, it had risen again to 31%. So we're at about a third of all workdays are happening at home. Now, the reality is that the press tends to talk about things in very bipolar ways, like, oh, everybody's working from home or everybody's going to an office. Yeah. And what's really happening is most people are working some kind of a hybrid situation, right? They work a few days from home and they work some days in the office. They come into the office when they have to have meetings, something like that. And I guess because it's not a simple message, the media doesn't talk about it as much. But that's the reality of what's happening today. Um, so right now, part day work. This is another indication, part day work. And that means, hey, I'm going to go to work at 10 and leave at two or three. That would be a part day in office, all right? 70% of all work days now are part day works. Wow. Okay. Meaning people, I mean, people might be coming in at 10 and leaving at seven, that kind of a thing. Because what's happened is, is, is the, the surveys have shown that workers, it's not that workers hate going to the office. They don't hate their work. They don't hate being in the office. What they hate is commuting. Yeah. But the time spent and the cost of commuting is so great. And if you think about it, you know, you got a car, you've got insurance, you got gasoline, you got all these costs. Or if you're commuting by train, you've got a significant cost. So the commuting takes 
money out of your pocket and it takes a lot of time. And that's time that we were using much more productively in the past. Yeah. So you could say, okay, I could uh, I could run off and, and, and take care of, uh, of, of getting my children my tour from school, or I could run quick errands to the bank or something, whatever I needed to do. I can do that from home and not really miss anything. Instead of having dead time sitting in the office, 30 minutes between meeting, I could be more productive with that time when I was working from home. So that it's to the point where workers have been very clear. They said, look, we'll take anywhere from a, a, a 10 to 20% pay cut just to have a hybrid working environment. So it's really become quite paramount, okay, that this is the way work is going to happen. And so I get struck because in our work, we talk to people and they'll say, well, Adam, isn't this ball still up in the air? Are we still having to try to figure out what's going on? And, and the, the one I want to try to drive home is no, no, the decision has been made. We are, in fact, now going to be in a hybrid working environment going forward. And so it, these bosses who are saying, come to work or you're going to get fired, are in a, that's a very bad place to yeah, be. That's a losing proposition. Yeah. I mean, a lot of your top talent is going to say, fine, I'm going to go find a job someplace else then if you're going to treat me that way. Right. And so you can't you, you I'm trying to impress this upon our listeners that don't think of this as an open question. Don't think of this as something that's still yet to be figured out. We have data. And we have, you know, the, the opinions of people and we see how they're behaving. So the trend to work from home, like you said, you, you started doing it years ago. I, more than 20 years ago, was doing a lot of work from home. And as technology came along, we did more and more. Certainly the laptop computer had a lot to do with that. When we could carry our laptops around, we really were taking the office with us most of the time. And so now half of all businesses, office buildings are still empty. Okay. This is a statistic we track. It, it's slow to change because they're long-term leases. Most leases are at least a year. Many of them are longer than that. So you have, you know, it's not considered empty, even if nobody's in the office. You know, if somebody's still got a lease on it, then it's not considered an empty office right. building. So we're at 50%. And that means that there's a lot of unused office space. So we have to think about what are the implications. We could see this become a significant problem for banks. So remember the Great Recession of 2009, 10, 11, uh, 9 and 10 in particular. At that time, the thing that caused the Great Recession was the banks had loaned a lot of money to houses that were not viable. You know, people yeah. were flipping houses, right? Remember the flipping, great flipping thing? So they'd buy a house, they'd do little or no work to it, hold it for a short time, flip it around, sell it to somebody else. And, you know, there were these houses that were just empty sitting around, and there was a glut of these houses. And the banks had issued all these mortgages on these houses. And the, the, the Great Short is a movie that tells about how whenever uh, it, the, the thing reached a pinnacle where people, there was nobody else to flip a house to, and the, and the flipping stopped, and all of a sudden people were stuck with one or more mortgages they couldn't afford, and they had they got thrown out of their houses, or they were just sitting empty anyhow, and people had to declare bankruptcy. And all of a sudden those mortgages were defaulted, and that put the banks in a situation where the banks looked like they could fall. Of course, Lehman Brothers went out of business, and, it, and there was a real run on the banks. So that's the risk we have to look at now, is that banks have a lot of mortgages on office buildings, and what's going to happen to those mortgages? The Federal Reserve is tracking that now. It's, and we're talking about zombie buildings out there yeah. in the marketplace that have no use. And I think that our listeners need to be aware that, one, you can't force people back into the office. And, two, there will be ramifications. If you try, all of them will be negative. The more you embrace this, the better off you're going to be. So the first thing is about the trend in the workforce. By the way, I did some research and found out that Zoom, when it said it wanted people back in the office, they actually, the press got it mostly wrong. What they said was that if you live within 50 miles of, the, of Zoom's headquarters, you should come, plan to come to the office two days a week. And the way they determined that was by interviewing the employees. When they talked to the employees who lived in the area and who came to the office, they said, how many days on average do you come in here for in-person meetings or for some reason that, where you find it valuable in the office? They said, we find two days a week to be the most common uh, number. So they said, okay, we're going to adopt that as our HR policy if you live within 50 miles. But if you live more than 50 miles away, you don't have to come into the office, right? There's no requirement to come into the office at all. So the press made a big deal out of it because, of, of course, Zoom being the company they were. But the employees said, look, there's a, there's a value to getting together. So hybrid is really where we are now, and hybrid is going to continue to be that way. And, and I want to also then impress upon leaders that they have to be careful about their bias, and how, even if they're not happy with hybrid work, the bias can get them in a lot of trouble. Then there's this thing now called proximity bias. 
And I think I think it existed as a term before work from home came in. I think it had to, yeah. psychologists were using it for understanding what happens when you're around people on a regular basis. And so proximity bias, I looked this up. So it is um, the way you can often see it applied at the workforce is that the, the employees who aren't in the office start being excluded. Where an employer will say, well, I want to talk to somebody about this problem. And they'll say, oh, look, Manny's in the office. So, you know, let, let me go chat with Manny. Rather than saying, hey, let's get Manny and get Adam on the phone. And we'll sit in right. my office or we'll sit in Manny's office. And all well, three of us will talk. You just say, I was going to go talk to Manny. This is where you favor the people that you are seeing every day or the, you're favoring the people that are around you when, in fact, that's not the best policy that you should have. And so proximity bias can can definitely happen in the workforce where you can start saying, you know, you, you exclude people that aren't in the office. You say, hey, I want to talk about uh, customer Z. And so I go, well, Manny's in the office. I want to run down and have a chat with Manny or we'll give Manny a call. Have him come to my office. We'll have a chat about this. And, but we're not going to bother to hook Adam in on the call. We're not going to bother to Skype him or Zoom him in. That's proximity bias. And you just, you might yeah. say, well, I don't really think it's happening. Well, it happens around the edges, right? It just starts happening around. It's just quicker and easy to go ask Manny. And, uh, and, and that bias will cause you to exclude these people. And then they're not going to be involved in the decision making. And that's bad for your company, right? Because you want the best thoughts. You want the most thoughts. You want the best data. But something that's similar to that and second in form of proximity bias is where you exclude people from stretch opportunities. Now, Manny, right. you and I talk to people all the time about having white space or blank space projects where we're trying to stretch the company. We're trying to take new products to market. We're trying to get into new markets. Right. We're trying to find those stretch opportunities like you know, in the extreme as Virgin with all the different businesses they have. So if you're having conversations about how we could try to grow the business and you're not making an effort to include everybody, meaning the people that aren't in the office, then you're not getting all the ideas. You may not be getting the best ideas and you're certainly not having the best discussion. So when you say, well, I'm going to go have a, you know, I'm going to have a, a, a break. I'm going to take a 15 minute break from my normal uh, activities or 30 minute break. Oh, let's, get around. Let's, let's, let's brainstorm for a little while this idea that we had about a new product. But you only do it with people in the office. That's proximity bias. You say, well, it's easy. I just want to do it with them. Proximity bias there gets you into trouble. Then the third level of proximity bias is the most dangerous of all. And that's where you start. Um, when you do reviews, yeah. you give better reviews to the people you're seeing in person. Then you start giving more reviews. You know, a problem, you know, like in the review, you would say, you know, I, I think everything's going great, Manny. But, you know, since I don't see you in the office anymore, I wonder about your commitment to the company. Or Manny, I wonder about uh, your idea generation. I'm not hearing from you as often as when you were in the office. And since I don't hear from you, I, I just can't give you the same level of review. That's just proximity bias, you know, because you're not making the effort to include Manny, because you're not making the effort to get the employees involved. You're starting to say, okay, I don't fa value them and I review them more poorly. And maybe even I don't promote them. You start saying, I'm going to promote the people I see every day in the, in the office. So you need to be really, really aware as a leader if you have proximity bias these days. If your mindset is to think the people who came in the office are better than the people who don't come in, then you could, you know, subconsciously exude this kind of a bias. Yeah. I think that the sooner that the leadership can adopt the idea of, uh, well, first of all, being aware of proximity bias is already inherently going to help you with it. But when you have that opportunity of, okay, let's, uh, you know, Manny's in the office, let's go talk to him. But it, let's also give Adam a call and loop him in to the, you know, to the Zoom or, or Teams call. And I think it's very important. I mean, we've talked about bias a lot. And I think it's it's some of these um, leadership that is just, I don't know if we want to call it lazy. Potentially it's lazy. Potentially it's just, uh, you know, the uh, sight and scene kind of thing. You've got to go beyond that and really make an effort to, include the other folks so you're not uh, sort of succumbing to this uh, proximity bias issue. Yeah, when I worked for the DuPont company in the late 80s, I was running business development and uh, I had been brought in from the outside, pretty unusual for DuPont. It was a tend to bring people in and move them up the company. I was the youngest at my level and I was the highest paid at my level because they had recruited me from the outside. And so my boss, uh, he, he was a cigarette smoker. And in those days, people could smoke sometimes in their office but they'd said you couldn't smoke in meeting rooms anymore. And then they were also pushing people to go outside and smoke. But it wasn't like today where, hey, if you work somewhere, you've got to be outside or off premise if you're going to smoke. 
So what he would do is he would take smoke breaks. And it didn't take very long until we started to realize that when he took a smoke break and he's sitting out there for five, ten minutes, that was the time you could capture him. You know, it's kind of like, you know how it is. Boss's time was often hard to get. And so you say, oh, yeah. the boss is having a smoke break. Let's run out there. And so people started actually carrying packs of cigarettes who weren't smokers so that they could come out and they'd have a cigarette or they'd bring their pack out. And they, you know, all of them were getting the same brand of boss smoke. So they'd come, like, see him go out to the outside and they'd say, oh, he's going to take a smoke break. They'd run and say, hey, boss, can I offer you a cigarette? And then they would sit there, you know, and they'd sort of pretend to smoke because they couldn't inhale. And the other one, I actually at that time started to smoke little cigars. And it was because I wasn't a smoker and I didn't care for cigarettes at all. And I had a friend that was from France and he smoked these little cigars. They call them cigarillos. And so he showed me how to get them. And so I started to have these cigars, you know, a couple of them a day at work. And it was only so I could spend time with the boss. And But that was proximity bias because when he was out there, he was talking to people. And if you weren't part of the conversation, you never knew quite what was going to happen, right? So that was an example of this. Now we're seeing it. Hey, you can exclude people that still want to work from home if you're not careful. And it's your, and it, again, we call it a bias because you have to address it. You have to say to yourself, am I letting this happen? And you should tell the people around you and ask them, are we letting this happen? Are we including everybody or are we biased towards only talking to the people who came in the office today? So make sure that you talk about it with your HR department, talk about it with your staff. So that then if you go down and say, hey, Manny, let's have a conversation, then Manny, you might look at me and say, let's get Adam in on that call, right? Let's make sure we've got all the people that we need to yeah, have this meeting. Exactly. It's, it's important that people start to recognize this. Then the other piece, which is around this whole office building, means that, hey, if you need to rethink about how what size office buildings you know, need and how you should have those set up. If people are only coming in the office two days a week, do they need an office or do we do shared office formats? And how do you try to make that work so you can reduce your footprint and lower your cost, right? Um, I remember consulting firms for the longest time, the, the Monday, Tuesday through Thursday, there was nobody there but an admin answering the phone, right? Because most people left on either Sunday or Monday to the client, and they didn't come back until Friday. So you might see some people in the office Mondays and Fridays, but rarely, if you were there Tuesday through Thursday, it meant your billability was slow. So it was a bad thing to be seen in the office. But we had all these empty office yeah. buildings. But we paid rent. We thought that was a great idea. Clients came in. They saw these beautiful offices. But now it's totally changed. The whole thought process, somebody comes in, sees empty offices. They're like, why am I paying a consultant to have empty offices? You know, you need to rethink that and how what it projects. And now if you start to move away from that, now you've got to start to also pay attention to where your banking relationships exist. Because if you're doing banking with somebody that has a lot of commercial lending and they're at risk, here you are running a business. You don't want to end up in the situation the tech companies did a few months ago when we tightened up and first Silicon Bank ended up, you know, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, sorry, Silicon Valley Bank ended up uh, in, in serious trouble. And a lot of people had to move fast. And the ones who moved fast caused the ones who didn't move fast a lot of grief. Because they, you know, they were draining money out of that bank by the hour, and that's yeah. what caused it to shut down. So you should pay attention to this stuff. It's not just a podcast listening thing. I would be paying attention to what's going on with that. Yeah, and you know, we talk about this a lot. Is is action and execution is paramount. Yes. We can we can you know yell until we're blue in the face, but unless you make that decision and actually execute, it's not going to happen. Um, I've seen it happen right in front of me with a couple of clients that I'm working with that they don't they're afraid to make decisions, right? They, 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 yeah. well, they hear, uh, I heard your podcast. This was an amazing thing you talked about. And I said, okay, did you implement it? Well, I don't know. I don't know if my staff is going to go for it. I don't know if this, I'm not, then why are you even talking about it? I mean, you're going to be stagnant and the market does not s slow down. The market's constantly moving. And if you're not in that, uh, you know, fast moving, fast moving river, you're going to be left behind in the swamp. Well, last week I did a multi-company workshop. You know, I do these pretty regularly, uh, eight um, with CEOs. And they, when I was doing the discussion about the world changing and are you preparing for it in the white space, and I said, okay, how many of you have one dedicated resource to artificial intelligence and how to apply it to your business? And it's just become commonplace. I get the none. And then they'll say, but that's okay. You know, I have a couple people looking at it on the side. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You think that you can just on the side of somebody look at it be nonchalant? This AI is coming at us faster than the internet did. That required cables and wiring. And, you know, we all had to upgrade all of our computers and it took a tremendous amount of infrastructure for the internet to become really, really popular. AI doesn't require that infrastructure. So consequently, people are already well into applying AI and you're sitting there yeah. saying, you, you're just sort of thinking about it. 
No, it's time to get action oriented about it. It's time to put some resources onto applying how artificial intelligence can help move your company. These are things that I keep trying, like I'm trying to get across. These are not something where I'm saying, hey, this might happen. It is happening. It's it happening will already. Happen. Yeah, you can plan on it. Let me take another one, for example. When we talk about demographics, we talk about the workforce, and one of the things that's happening today are strikes. Okay, so, you know, we might, let me just take, kind of go through where we are on strikes. The UAW has been on strike for five and a half weeks. It's the first time they've struck all three U.S. auto companies, and it's already into this, you know, into one of the long-term strike situations. Um, uh, Fed Ford's chairman, Bill Ford, says that the company could go bankrupt if the union doesn't cave. I don't think they're going to cave, right? The, look, remember SAG-AFTRA, the uh, actor strike? They've been on strike 100 days. They aren't even in negotiations. They're not even discussing at this point. Um, the Screenwriters Guild of America, they went on strike for five months. Finally, the, uh, uh, the, the companies like Disney and, and the people who uh, produce shows caved in and gave them everything they wanted. They got everything they wanted, right? So this is what I think people have to start to understand, that the people at the Screenwriters Guild knew the world has changed. We, the, the, the employee has more clout. They didn't have clout years ago. We didn't see wages going up. People were being forced to work for less than, than a livable wage in many circumstances. The Screen Act, the writers for, for television and movies were seeing their pay go way down. I wrote for Forbes for eight years. I'll never forget when I started, they said, we'll give you a penny of viewer at the end of the year. I was making over a thousand, I was making close to $5,000 a month. And they just came in and said, no, we can't afford to pay you that. And every year they gave me a different contract and they said, you take it or leave it. The net of it was the more and more readers I had didn't matter. I was going to not make more than a thousand dollars a month because that's all they were going to pay me. Right. And so I walked off the job. Now they no longer pay writers at all. In fact, 90% of the content on Forbes.com, somebody pays to go there. If you want to have your article published, just call up Forbes.com. If you give them five or six thousand dollars, they'll publish it. Okay, they, that's how bad they've gotten at this point. Yeah. So if the world has changed, the world has, has moved quickly, and these and employees have this clout. And you know, if Ford can't figure out how to pay employees more, if it can't rethink and say, look. Here's the deal with electric cars and internal combustion cars. This is the transition we have to make. And we're going to have to rethink our business model. And here's how we're going to do it. Maybe you give up the franchises, the Ford dealer franchises, like you've had all these years. And you go to a model like Tesla where you sell direct so that you don't have to have these guys in the middle taking a cut out of the deal. you got to start to think it hard because these guys have clout. But Adam, I, that's not how we do things here. That's right. Now, Kaiser Permanente, their healthcare workers went on strike. That strike lasted a whopping uh, three days before Kaiser Permanente said, get back to work. We'll give you whatever you want. And they just caved in and gave them whatever they wanted. Um, the, uh, the Detroit uh, casino workers, 3,700 of them, have said they're going to go out on strike. And uh, in Las Vegas, uh, 60,000 casino workers on, on September the 15th said, okay, we're ready to strike. And they started picketing. They haven't gone on strike. 95% of authorized to strike. And you have to sit here and say, look, understand who's got the clout. You know, it, 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 when, when, when we live in a world today where there's so many older people and they've left their jobs and they've got not enough younger people to do all these jobs, they've got the clout and they're going to yeah. get paid. And, they're going to, and, and if you think you're going to go into these negotiations and hold out and pretend like it's the 1940s, 50s or 60s or 70s, you're wrong. You're just wrong. And these guys are going to win. And will they sink the ship? Maybe. Maybe, maybe Ford will, you know, Bill Ford will sit there and he'll, he'll, he won't change and, and he'll go bust and Ford will die and those employees will lose their jobs. Maybe that's what will happen. But, but they're saying, look, that's okay. Because you know what, if Ford dies, there's going to be electric cars made. Maybe we'll go work for Tesla. Or maybe we'll go work for somebody else. I'm not going to continue to work for suboptimal pay. That's what they're saying. People are saying, I'm not going to come to an office when I don't have to. Hybrid work is the future and you're going to pay me or I'm not going to work for you. I'm going to work for somebody else. And that's just the way it is. And if, and if you're in a business where you're saying, hey, that is going to cripple me, then you got to rethink your business. You got to start saying, where can I use artificial intelligence or where can I use robotics? Where can I replace people with computers, with algorithms? Where can I replace people with mechanical items and automation? How do I change my model so that I can afford to have these people come to work? The, the simple approach of, well, I want the business I've had, and I want you to keep working for a little money. That isn't going to happen. And I think you can be pretty confident, and you better start preparing for the fact that CEOs are going to be able to get pay themselves these monstrous salaries that they've done during my generation. You got you to know, the top, you got to yourself whatever you wanted. These people are going to fight back. 
I just had an, an idea, Adam, for something that we, you and I can create and maybe uh, distribute as a, um, a download of some sort is, you know, really a, an action guide for leadership in, in business to look in, inward at their business uh, for a moment to see how the outward trends are affecting them. And I think we can pick maybe three in particular, maybe we pick um, AI, uh, we can pick the, the, the whole working from home business. And then maybe we can talk about something else. I think it's it's important that we have something to uh, something to give these leaders to make these decisions because we talk all the time about this and we're in it and they are not. Uh, so I think that might be something we can we can put together, Adam, and then maybe put out in the next couple of weeks. Okay, well, we'll we'll give it a run. We'll give it a run. But I do because I do think people have to understand if you're making the decision about your ad copy or where to place advertising, you're going to fall behind fast because now. There are people using artificial intelligence that have much wider data sets. They know where the eyeballs are and they know what the eyeballs are reading. And they're, they're able to get out there and get their message across and more meaningfully to more people using artificial intelligence than you can. So if you're not thinking about it from advertising, that's bad. If you're not thinking about it from writing your HR manual, why would you sit down and write an HR manual today whenever you can take advantage of every HR manual that all these AI engines have, have already read? Yeah. And, you know, you don't know a lot of specifics about the law. They do. The AI the, the department, they have it. So why would you be writing that whenever you could have some yeah. artificial intelligence tool making the best of it? Warranty notices. There's all kinds of places you can think about how the, how you could use this technology. But if all you're doing is thinking about it, well, it's like thinking about the Internet, you know, or thinking about cell phones and, and you got a landline. I mean, folks, you got to get in the game. You got to get out there and you got to make it happen. These are very real trends. We you know what I mean? We track this all the way back to demographics. We say, okay, here's the number of people. This is where the cloud's going, and this is why it's going to turn out this way. I understand that our listeners, they don't have time to go back and do that. But don't let yourself fall into the trap of saying, oh, I'm seeing it, but I don't understand how it applies to me, and therefore I'm not going to bother. Start yeah. saying, wait a minute. You don't, you don't want the market to move you. Right. At the very end, you don't want to be that laggard that is forced to, OK, now I'm going to implement uh, this thing called the Internet or this these mobile devices. Oh, yeah. So you don't want to be that person. You want to be the person that is right in that wave. And they're going to really crush the, the ones past that. So you got to get on uh, get on the game. I can remember when mobile phones came along and employers said, hey, you look, you pay for your own mobile phone. Well, sales guys that were on commission all did that because they knew that being with a mobile phone on the road, they could outperform, the, you know, they could get their commissions up because they would outperform the guys that didn't have a mobile phone. Some of the companies that had less, had more restrictive and, you know, like you reached a cap and then your commission percentages went down. Those guys didn't bother, but the companies did badly because they say, okay, fine, I reached my cap. You know, you're not going to give me a cell phone. I got no aggressiveness. I'm going to store up all my notes and come to the office one day a week and I'll call up, hey, on Friday, I'll say, hey, you gave me a call on Tuesday. I'm answering your call, right? Meanwhile, the company, the competitor that had cell phones for its employees, they were answering the same day. They're getting their business, right? And so that's the where we are with AI already. We're already at that level of adoption and it's really time that everybody kind of wake up and realize that but that's the direction that they have to head. They have to start making these decisions. I mean, give me another example. We talked about um, Disney. They own uh, NBC and um, no, they own, they own ABC. Sorry, Comcast owns NBC. Um, the but the, the reality is is that these companies are out there. And I and for ten years I've been saying, hey, look, look at Netflix. Look what's happening with Netflix. And what's going on here is that every year there's less opportunity for t network television. And so what's it becoming? It's becoming re TV sports, you know, live sports were on television because they were the, you wanted to watch it live and you couldn't stream it. They didn't have enough bandwidth for people to stream. Well, we're quickly getting over that hump, right? And now yeah. you can start to stream ball games. So now we're losing live TV. And so they fall back on reality TV. You know, there was a time when you turned on the television and you had scripted dialogue every night. And you watched it every night. When I was a little boy, we used to watch game shows, you know, that came with to tell the truth and, and the, the dating game. But I mean, that was that was 50 years ago, right? 55 years ago. Then we got into scripted. Now we're going back to the game shows because, again, no script, no writers. It's cheap. You know, you don't have actors. You got people coming on the show. Don't get paid anything unless they win a game. That sort of a thing. Well, let me tell you what's happened. I, mean, I said that's where they're going to end up and it's going to fail. Well, OK, of the top 50 shows in 2010, of the top 50 shows, one third of those were reality TV shows. So we had Survivor, 
right? And we had uh, the, the, the people who lost a lot of weight. I'm trying to remember what that was called. Big Loser, I think it was called. So in 2010, one third of the top 50 shows were uh, reality TV or game shows. We now have many, many more reality TV and game shows in 2023 than we had in 2010. Take a guess what you think the percentage of top 50 shows are reality or game shows. 50. 12. 12. 12. And that's because your top 50 shows aren't even on broadcast anymore. Now they're off on Hulu and they're on um, Netscape and there are other places. The thing is, is that the, the people will go where they get to watch what they want to watch. So if they want to watch something that's scripted, they're going to find it and they're finding it not on the broadcast television. They're finding it on these other sources. So it gets back to this idea that broadcast TV is quickly dying. And it's not going to, it doesn't, it's lost its value proposition, right? And it's got, its value proposition was to inform and entertain the public. That's the job, inform and entertain the public. They re, the government restricted it, the FTC restricted it because they wanted to be careful with bandwidth. And so that's why you had these big three networks. And later we got Fox, which was the fourth. Um, but then on the side came along, you know, these guys like with, with CNN, right? And uh, they started to put out different kinds of content on, the, on something called cable. Well, now what's happened is, the, you know, your job was to, inform and entertain you had to chase all those you needed to chase cable now you need to chase yeah. the internet you need to chase streaming but unfortunately the, these networks didn't do that they tried yeah, to just keep enough. running more programming now they've relied on uh, reality tv and sports and they're losing that base and so it's the generation now that's in say high school is probably going to be looking back in 20 years and saying people used to sit and watch a television fascinating you mean you didn't go in and say the program you want and, you know, you, you just sat there and watched somebody Adam, else's programming? Yeah. I got a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old, and they already know that. They don't, they, they don't understand how, you know, we yeah. go visit my, grand, my, my parents and they, they're just baffled at how they're, you know, they're going to watch the program. Or my grandmother watches the novelas in Spanish. Yeah. It, it just boggles the mind. And the way we laugh at, at landline TVs, they're going to be laughing at uh, – at, 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 at folks and the way we watch television. And I want to kind of conclude this with one that is a complete fad. Watching trends and acting on trends is crucial. But then other people say, well, Adam, how do you tell the difference between a trend and a fad? And I'm always like, well, I do it all the time. So it's easy for me. It may be harder for you. But, you know, you want to invest in trends. You want to ignore fads. And so you may recall that I said at the beginning that non-fungible tokens were a fad, that people who were buying artwork on NFTs and buying all these different NFTs were wasting their money. And so therefore it was probably going to, uh, it was a bad place to put your money. And I've also always been a critic of the, the, the NFTs that are, you know, the, the cryptocurrencies. And right now the only one that's really got any legs left in it at all is Bitcoin. The rest of them have all died off. We got Sam Brinkman free, going to go to prison for years for corruption. And we're finding out that you know, crypto is just a joke. But, but before I go on to my crypto, non-fungible tokens, they really hit the marketplace in 2020. Okay, that was when the art NFTs came along, and people could get you know my I call yeah. Pokemon on, online. So there was they, they peaked in 22 with the total number of searches of people looking for NFTs and finding them that kind of thing. So we took that Google searches. Nobody's searching on NFTs in 2020. They hit a peak in 2022. Guess now how many people are, are searching around NFTs in all forms of NFTs compared to the peak of uh, January 22. 20%. Five. The market has crashed 95% of people even in, in, in doing in research, insight, looking things up. It was a dead, it was a dead on arrival idea, these NFTs. Yeah. And so it's important that people start paying attention because I know some people that blew money on NFTs, you know, thousands of dollars buying NFT art, they call right. it. I'm like, the what? Board ape and all that crap, right? Yeah, yeah. It was, a, it's a, it was a dumb idea. And, you know, 10,000 people have a dumb idea. It's still a dumb idea, right? So it's important to know trends, know the difference with a fad, because you don't put up money in fads, you put your money into trends. And you need to realize what those trends are in the workplace and be the first one to get there and take advantage of it. Very well said, Adam. Very well said. I think this will conclude our podcast for today. And uh, certainly I, I want to definitely discuss that idea, Adam, of creating that 
that uh, user guide or work guide that uh, we can give to our listeners. It just makes a lot of sense to us because we're, we're in it, we live it, we breathe it. But for those that are maybe new listeners, new viewers to our podcast, this is a something that you can use as a framework to, to go forward and create some action in your business. Thank right, you, Manny. Take care. Cheers.